All right, we should have everybody on the line now. Um, so we're ready to go. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, how working remotely has changed our approach to endpoint security. Today's webinar is being presented by Hyslate, Elusive, and Team 8. My name is Marielle Sable, and I'm the marketing manager at Hyslate. I'm going to be your moderator during this webinar. Before I introduce you to our presenters, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping rules. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with your colleagues. We also invite you to comment and question on today's webinar. Please look at the Q&A chat box on your screen. If you think of a question for the speaker at any point, just type it in there and I will either pose it to our speakers at the time or hold it for the discussion portion at the end of the event. We have all attendees automatically muted during the session. Today's presenters are Tal Zamir, the founder and CTO of Hyslate, Olfair Israeli, founder and CEO of Elusive, and Nadav Zafrir, founding partner of Team 8. Nadav is focused on driving global growth for Team 8 and is the architect of Team 8's relationships across the business, academic, and technology worlds. Nadav's experience has positioned him well to help define the opportunities and challenges in today's technology marketplace. Prior to founding Team 8, he served as commander of Unit 8200, Israel's elite military technology unit, where he established the Israeli Defense Forces Cyber Command Unit. 8200 is recognized as the informal talent incubator for the nation's renowned tech industry. Nadab's belief is that innovation is found at the edge of chaos and has informed his perspective as Team 8 developed, introduced, and scaled technology, technology companies. Nadab, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone, and uh, uh, thanks for uh, joining today. Um, <clears throat> so I want to just give you a short introduction to uh, uh, Team 8, and then I'll let Ofer and uh, Tal take over. Just to give you guys an understanding of uh, our background and who we are <clears throat> and why we're comfortable in this kind of uh, uh, in cyber risk, etc., uh, I want to start by talking about uh, where we come from uh, and the military mindset of where we come from. So <clears throat> in a military mindset, you're always operating amidst complexity and uncertainty. And in many ways, that serves us well uh, in today's atmosphere where complexity and uncertainty are king. Um, when you are in a military uh, organization you're always trying to understand what's coming but you have very little control and the complexity of the environment means that many moving parts in many different areas many nodes in the network that you are a part of and that surrounds you you have very little control of which leads to uh, an extreme uncertainty a really fast pace of change in an adversarial environment with huge amounts of data and in many ways, uh, 8200, which is the Israeli version of the uh, NSA, has learned uh, over the last few decades out of necessity to deal uh, with this uh, um, concept of uh, un complexity and uncertainty. Um, and what the, the, what the attributes that we have uh, in terms of being able to be adaptive, agile, failure tolerant, resilient, collaborative, and constantly rethink uh, where we're going, um, we have been able to transfer from one environment to the other uh, into what we do today uh, uh, at, uh, at Teammate, uh, at Isolate, and at Elusive. At the Teammate level, we see ourselves as company builders. We have created a platform, which I'll elaborate a little bit about, um, a village that surrounds it and a, and a disciplined process directed into doing two things. Number one, understanding where identifying big problems, then creating a process that de-risks the ideation around these problems. And then finally, creating solutions that are fundamental to de-risk those problems and deal uh, with the risk that they present enterprise around the world. And so <clears throat> in order to understand where these problems are coming from, 
And in order to identify them in a clear and crisp way, uh, we have created a village around Team 8 of literally hundreds of CISOs and CIOs from global 2000 companies to really understand where their pain point is um, so and identify these problems. And then we created a process that focuses on these problems in order to create a viable solution to these problems. I think in today's world uh, where we live, where what we see right now uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, <clears throat> this has become more relevant than ever. In many ways, if you zoom out to where we are right now, we are in, a, in the phase of starting to plan for the future, trying to understand what the future holds. What does that mean in terms of risk? What does that mean for digital trust and infrastructure? Because if you think about it, trust in our digital systems has never been more important than it is right now. I think we started this uh, uh, crisis with a phase of denial. Um, sort of, you know, what does this have to do with us? Uh, why do we even have to deal with it? Uh, I think we then got into sort of a state of shock when we understood that, hey, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, everybody's going home. We're going to move from a, an environment where tops 5% of our workforce is working remotely to almost 95% of our workforce uh, working remotely, in some cases, even more. That in reality led to a little bit of a euphoria once we got home and we saw, hey, you know what, this isn't so bad. We can actually get stuff done and still have dinner with our family, only to lead to despair and panic when we understood that this is a long process and that, yes, the infrastructure is actually holding up and, and in most cases allowing us to keep the lights on. However, we haven't stress tested it. And so, again, it introduces new risk that we ha we weren't uh, uh, aware of. And I think where we are today is we're starting to understand that this is the time to start to imagine what the future will look like. What does it mean for our digital infrastructure? What does it mean for cyber risk? How are people going to be working and what are the new risks that that's going to introduce into our systems? At a point of time <clears throat> where connectivity and trust in our digital infrastructure has never ever been more important. And right now, <clears throat> we're a little bit of a chaos. And that chaos is introduced to us in the fact that we're already opening up, but the numbers are still going up in many parts of the world. Um, you know, the economy is probably never, the real economy has probably never been in a more dire situation in our lifetime, yet the markets are at, a whole, at an all time high. So what does all that mean? And how do we find that Goldilocks place amidst this complexity, amidst this uncertainty, and what seems like chaos. <clears throat> and one of the things that we advocate at Team 8 and our companies is not to shy away from chaos, but actually embrace it. Because at the edge of chaos, if you can identify that Goldilocks point, you can create the right balance. In security, what that means, the right balance between security and productivity, uh, for example. Um, now, of course, it depends on what industry you're in. <clears throat> you know, if you're Carnival Cruise, um, then you're in a state where you probably have a, a zero budget for, for next year's security program. Whereas if you're Zoom, um, you're probably in a pretty good state. You never imagined you'll be uh, spending so much because uh, uh, business has never been any better. For most of you, you're probably somewhere in between. Um, and one of the things that we think uh, uh, at Elusive, at Isolate, and at Team 8 that we should advocate is that security should be about understanding the business so ultimately we can create more confidence in our digital infrastructure so that our businesses can continue to thrive. Now, <clears throat> if you look at, the, at this chart, Hyperconnectivity has been on the rise uh, at almost uh, um, exponential uh, uh, at an exponential uh, phase somewhere around 2007. 
when things started to accelerate, you know, so uh, we, uh, Steve Jobs came up with the uh, uh, iPhone, smartphone, uh, the cloud became a real, uh, the cloud became a real technology that can be used by almost everyone. Android came out, social networks started to boom, etc. And that led to um, the ex exponential curve in hyperconnectivity. In and from the attacker's perspective, that created so many more opportunities for attackers. The green line of defense could not follow that. Uh, and that's the gap that we have created, that we have, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're dealing with right now in terms of trying to put more effort, more resources, more spend in order to protect our network. Um, but in all honesty, there isn't, there probably isn't a check large enough to solve the problems that we're dealing with. And COVID hasn't changed that. It's just accelerated that. Um, and so the probability of attack is higher. The susceptibility to an attack is higher, but the room for error on decision makers and security practitioners is lower because we're already in many ways in what we call plan B. Not many of us have a plan C. From an attacker's perspective, what does that mean? So if crime is motive plus opportunity plus means, they have all gone up. From the defense perspective, we have much higher visibility problems, which I'll talk about. From the attacker's perspective, opportunistic systematic phishing is at an all-time high. The attackers are working 24-7 to take advantage of this situation. In fact, some of the stuff that they're doing, you aren't seeing right now because, in fact, they're just planting the seed for the future rather than actually attacking right now because they understand that this Disneyland that they're living in right now where every home office has become a part of your corporate network is something that's not going to last. So it's, instead of going deep, they're going wide, planting those seeds. And then finally, malicious insiders, for many reasons, are on the rise, and Ofer will elaborate uh, on what we think that means. And so if to sum up this point, um, a couple of really fundamental changes in this in-between phase that we're in right now. The working from home is changing everything. My personal opinion is that we're not going to stay 95%, but I also don't think we're going back to where we were. So we need to reimagine what work means and how people are going to be operating in this new hybrid model of the future. Malicious insiders of many colors and many shades are out there. Some are just disgruntled employees. Some are afraid to lose their jobs. Some are just useful idiots that are collaborating without even knowing that they're collaborating from somebody from the outside, et cetera. But that's also on the rise. Attackers have many more opportunities. And the question, of course, is what do we do about it from many perspectives? Again, this is a great time to be an attacker. Many more opportunities at a lower risk. Um, the noise, for example, in your security operations center has never been higher. It's almost deafening. Um, one example that I can give you is that traditional <clears throat> artificial intelligence that's been thrown in in the last couple of years is less relevant than it was before because a lot of what this AI does is it creates a normal <clears throat> or a baseline and tries to track anomalies. But in the current situation, what's normal is not even known. Nothing is normal right now. And if you don't know what's normal, what's abnormal, uh, it doesn't matter how good of an uh, AI system you have, you can't solve that. So that's just one example. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the attack surface, again, I don't want to get into all these numbers, but you can see that it's on the rise. Uh, in different parts of the world, uh, different things. We, we did our own teammate survey with our village. Um, you can see that 35% uh, of the companies, for example, are reporting a faster move to the, uh, to the cloud, uh, et cetera. Um, you can see that 80% uh, um, are seeing more attacks, but 90% of those attacks are the same known attacks uh, with a different flavor or with a shorter time in between. 
I'll skip this one. <clears throat> one more thing that um, I want to say before I hand it over to Ofer and uh, Tal is that on the advanced persistent threat, what we call the nation state or the more sophisticated attackers, we're already seeing um, that many of the concepts, capabilities, and ideas that were part of a nation state advanced persistent threat are finding their way and trickling down uh, to less sophisticated, less focused or targeted criminal groups. And that's something that we need to be aware of. Um, again, attackers are working 24 seven. They're taking advantage of new critical infrastructure that you know, wasn't considered as critical uh, or critical at all, maybe just important in the past, uh, um, just like the webinar that we're, the, the infrastructure that we're using right now. Um, I think toilet paper has been solved already. The other thing is about lateral movement. Um, the fact that um, many of you uh, had to relax some of your um, guidelines with regards to who can do what from where is creating a direct line and creating less lateral movements needed in order to get to some of the crown jewels. So the, the number of hops required may be uh, decreasing, creating a much higher need to make sure that we clean up everything so that we don't actually give the attackers, once they land on an endpoint, which could be in home office right now, the keys to the kingdom. I think phishing is obvious. Um, I think the point here um, is actually, uh, you know, just more and more uh, education to more and more employees so that the level of awareness is higher. It's just so much easier uh, right now um, to create uh, a non-sophisticated phishing that at normal times would probably be noticed by most people. But at these times, when we're all curious and uh, they're breaking news every five minutes, we're just more susceptible uh, to clicking on those things and uh, attackers are taking advantage of this uh, situation. We're seeing uh, a surge in ransomware. Um, you know, ransomware are, is sort of a brilliant way on the business uh, return on investment ROI side for attackers. Instead of having to steal information from enterprise and then sell it to a third party, um, you're taking the enterprise inf information and you have a built-in, uh, you have a built-in uh, uh, buyer for your information as you're doing it. Um, moving on, malicious insiders, and this is something that Ofer uh, uh, will elaborate on. We're all <clears throat> in a different environment. We have our kids in our environment, as you can tell. Uh, we have uh, dogs running around. Um, there's a convergence of physical and virtual. There's a convergence of home and work. Um, that creates a different psychological, I would say, contract between employee and employer. Um, and if you look at the charts, we've seen in research from the past that this leads to a uh, uh, heightening uh, or a raise in what we, what we see in insider threat. And that's another thing that you all should be uh, uh, aware of. Um, you know, from a bigger picture, and then I'll, uh, and I'll stop my presentation here, um, what we tell uh, the CISOs in our village is, look, these are hard times. Here are something, here's a couple of things that you should be thinking about. One is it's very easy for anybody at any position to get caught in the weeds of what's going on. And we recommend, I recommend to all of you on a personal side, on a business side, on a leadership side, zoom out every once in a while and try to understand what the big picture looks like. Second is we need to adapt to new frameworks and terminologies. I mean, if you haven't within your team started to use new language and jargon to operate with in amidst this crisis, then something is wrong. If, you, if, you, if your schedule is the same just on Zoom 
then I believe you're not doing the right thing. And then lastly, you must take care of yourself amidst this craziness because if you are uh, spending 15 or 18 hours on Zoom every day, you're not going to make it through this crisis. That's not good for you. It's not good for your family. It's not good, good for your people or your colleagues uh, and ultimately bad for, your, uh, for the uh, output in your enterprise. So I hope that was uh, uh, helpful uh, as setting the ground uh, and uh, I'll let you guys take it from here. Great, thank you so much for joining us today, Nadav, and for your insightful presentation. We're now gonna pass the mic over to Tal Zamir from Heislate and Ofer Israeli from Elusive, who will dive deeper into the endpoint and network security in a remote environment. First, we're gonna hear from Tal. Tal is a 20-year software industry leader with a track record of solving urgent business challenges by reimagining how technology works. Before founding Heislate, Tal incubated next-gen end-user computing products at VMware. Earlier, he was on the leadership team at Winova, a desktop virtualization startup acquired by VMware. Tal began his career in an elite IDF technology unit, leading mission-critical cybersecurity projects that won the Israeli Defense Award. Tal, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mariel, um, and thanks, Nadav, uh, for the intro and the context. Um, so I want to just first uh, relate uh, to what Nadav said about uh, remote work being the new norm. Um, definitely agree, and I think uh, we'll see that this is beyond just working from home. You know, even when things get back to normal, even if some companies do not uh, you know, um, work from home as a norm, um, they will still have a very large number of employees um, outside the parameter, um, working remotely, using unmanaged devices. And this is not just your employees working from home. Um, you know, those are uh, remote uh, mobile workers, road warriors, um, and all of the contractors and vendors and partners and consultants, um, your temp workers and seasonal workers, uh, branch workers and franchises. All of those um, have the same kind of problem and challenge that we've seen now with the COVID-19 uh, situation. But uh, this will just become a more uh, severe problem, a widespread problem. Um, just a stat that was published uh, yesterday, by the way, uh, more than 50% of new work from home employees are using their own personal computers for business use but the majority of them have not got any training on how to use those devices securely. So it's a widespread problem about um, all types of users, both employees and external users, and many of them will be using all kinds of unmanaged devices. So uh, in the, I wanna share with you just a few of the insights we've gathered over the last uh, you know, months during this crisis uh, from our customers um, and the challenges and pitfalls they ran in, into as they tried to uh, mitigate uh, the situation. And this basically falls into three main buckets uh, that, uh, of challenges that they had. Uh, the first one is user productivity challenges. Um, and I'm going to go into examples in a second. Second one uh, is security challenges uh, following uh, what Nadav described. Um, and third is um, IT costs and manageability, which is a, a big nightmare for many companies out there. I'm just going to give you a few examples just you know, to make sure that if you're looking at this problem now and planning for the future, that you have uh, in your checklist kind of uh, the things to look at and others, uh, the traps that others have fallen into. Um, so on the user productivity challenge front, um, there's things like, what do you do when everybody connects simultaneously at the same time uh, to your infrastructure, um, the Monday morning, It loads up and everybody connects together at the same time to their VDI infrastructure or over VPN. And this results in a terrible user experience uh, for some companies. Um, and even if you have perfect infrastructure, um, if the user's home network is loaded uh, because someone is using Netflix and hogging the network, then those kind of solutions, specifically VDI that are very sensitive to networking, um, they would just not let the user have a proper user experience and responsiveness. And this is even if you have the best infrastructure, networking, storage, compute in the data center. Um, then again, there's the challenge of how do you provide access to all of the different apps that the user needs in a secure way, not just the browser SaaS-based applications, but uh, all of those uh, other Windows apps, uh, both on Windows and other devices. Um, if you give out a laptop to the user at home, 
um, like a corporate owned laptop, uh, there's a this desk real estate problem. You know, how, where do will the user put that uh, laptop um, and set up his workstation with peripherals and so on? Uh, and finally, other, under this productivity challenge, uh, there's a lot of uh, privacy concerns that users have expressed to their uh, companies. Um, what is those agents and applications you installed on my machine actually doing? And are you kind of collecting data about my uh, you know, personal life? Um, and that's another challenge. So that's kind of one of the user challenges that the companies are seeing out there. But there's also a lot of security challenges. Uh, just to continue what Nadav started uh, mentioning, you know, an unmanaged device that the user might be using to access your network goes without saying, there's a high likelihood it's not just bring your own device, it's bring your own malware. You got off the shelf malware on that device um, that might be ransomware or data exfiltration or credential theft. It could be something that could propagate within your network if you let it connect over VPN. And on top of this, uh, you're now expected also to kind of immediately provision uh, a new wave of productivity apps like Zoom and uh, Teams and other stuff. Um, just as an anecdote, uh, Google prohibited the use of Zoom on, on laptops. Uh, but what can you do about it if you actually need to conduct business over Zoom? Um, so that is another security challenge of supporting those new apps, uh, allowing them to connect over split tunneling, um, you know, directly from the user's device with no controls. Um, and of course, the human element of uh, an insider kind of threat, which has uh, lots of motivation uh, and no one is watching over his shoulder uh, to see what they're doing. Um, and it's not just malicious intent, it could be just your family member um, using your laptop uh, for other uh, purposes while your corporate data is sitting there and by mistake uh, could be compromised. Um, from the IT perspective and IT challenges, of course, this is a huge um, complex project in many cases to deploy whatever solution you deploy for work from home, whether it's uh, VDI, VPN, or just managing the user's uh, devices, uh, any kind of devices they throw at you. Um, it's the deployment, it's the support element of it. When you have so many agents that you might need on the device and they might be invasive and you might not be able even to install them, how can you uh, tackle that? Um, the scalability uh, uh, issue of you know, setting up the infrastructure to support this in a cost-effective manner uh, is another kind of IT uh, challenge um, there. So with that uh, set of challenges, the productivity, user challenges, um, security, and IT, uh, there's a lot of debate going on and uh, in the conversations we had about which approach is the best. Uh, and a few examples of, uh, of debates and dilemmas uh, that customers have are, do I go with a corporate-owned uh, laptop approach or do I go with a BYOD approach um, and let people use their unmanaged devices? Another different dilemma is, do I let users connect uh, with native local applications like use their browser on their devices to connect to uh, SaaS applications? Or do I force them to go over with VDI or desktop as a service? Or do I go with a local container on their devices? Another dilemma is, do I go with a classic VPN approach or do I now migrate to zero trust kind of approach? Um, so with that kind of uh, perspective into place, I, I wanna just finish my, my uh, a few insights here uh, with um, my two cents and guidelines on what is the, the right approach in some cases. Of course, there's no single uh, right answer uh, and you should definitely you know, match the solution to the needs of your users. And there's probably a healthy mix of solutions uh, to meet different uh, types of needs. But uh, kind of as a golden rule guideline, I would say, if you have you know, less sensitive web apps, you know, uh, your attendance reporting uh, web app um, or anything of uh, you know, least uh, security uh, app, um, this can be accessed just directly over the web with any device. And this is kind of uh, the right solution for those least sensitive apps. On the other extreme, if you have all those legacy apps, uh, the one-offs that are uh, line of business apps that you need uh, to have, uh, in your data center, they might be touching super sensitive data um, and they might need you know, connectivity to all kinds of legacy systems. These of course uh, are best served over something like VDI, especially if they need to be uh, in proximity to their data. Um, and all the other apps, not the non-sensitive apps and not the super legacy, super sensitive apps, all of the, all of the in-between 
should uh, actually be in some kind of uh, local uh, strong container on the user's device to kind of balance between security uh, and productivity. Um, you got to you know, manage both. And by doing this, you might be able to scale quickly and let users have access to their applications in a way that is securely containerized on the device. And there's a variety of ways to do that. Um, and with that, uh, I'd love to uh, hand it over to offer uh, to have his take. Great, thank you, Tal. Um, and indeed, uh, many, many really interesting topics and, and items we should uh, we should be thinking about and, and get ahead of. Um, kind of, you know, the, the area I think the time we're in is super interesting. I mean, personally, we we all feel uh, how crazy it is every day, and we get news every day of, of a new crisis that hits us. I don't think anybody here is gonna forget 2020. Um, it, it's uh, it's the 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 gift that keeps on giving. But um, in that regard, uh, from a from a uh, uh, cyber perspective, I think we're yet to see the biggest challenges that lie ahead. And when you kind of look at the, at the threat landscape, there's really three different pieces that kind of come together in this crazy period and will uh, uh, most certainly uh, wreak quite a lot of havoc going forward. And that's really when you think about it, um, today there are more opportunities for attackers, there's more attackers, and there's less detection. And you combine these three things together and we're not in a good state. And we have not yet seen, I think, the tip of the iceberg of what that means. We dive into that, there's a lot that goes into it, but if, if we talk about the more opportunities, we basically took our whole world and overnight flipped it to work in a different type of environment. Uh, the good side of it is that it actually worked. Uh, people and companies are able to be productive. Uh, it could have been a different state. It could have been a state where we had flipped everything over and we just weren't able to work. So that's actually uh, somewhat surprising and somewhat a, a pleasant surprise. But at the same time, we've just taken our attack surface and our manageability of the attack surface that we've built for, for the last couple of decades and transformed it overnight. And everything is different, right? And when you think about more opportunities, now you have everybody 24 seven working from home. Um, do, are their home environments indeed secure? Do we know that all of our employees and users are updating to the latest uh, version of the firmware on their home router and uh, not using default passwords to access their smart TV and whatever the case may be? Probably not, right? So it, it's a lot easier to get into this extension of the network. We have people, um, their families are home. Their families very well may be using their work computers or they themselves are using their personal devices. And obviously that now we have our business application living together with uh, the latest version of the coolest game that, that your child may be using. Um, is that game safe? What does that mean? That obviously introduces additional risk. And uh, finally, uh, we, we've all needed to adapt to work in a different kind of way. And that adaptation is driving cloud usage, it's driving productivity tool usage, all kinds of things in that regard, many of which is a great thing. And it's a good thing that's happening, and it's a good thing that it's expediting it. But it also means that you have teams out there that are saying, heck, I need to be more productive in this specific area, so let me go out and look for a tool that's relevant. And does it really go through the security assessment and checking and so on and so forth? Most probably not. So. Overnight, we've gotten into a lot more opportunities for attackers. The attack surface is vastly larger. We don't even know how to manage it yet. We, we have some senses and there's some best practices, but there's a whole lot yet to learn in front of us. At the same time, there's a whole lot more attackers. And, and some of these attackers are attracted to it from, again, the more opportunities that are available. But also, let's not forget that we're amidst a uh, global financial crisis. Nadav mentioned the stock market is actually surprisingly doing well. Um, but if you look uh, under, the, under the sheets and understand what's actually happening, there's, there's obviously many question marks for many people of what that, the long-term implications are. There are layoffs. Uh, this all introduces financial pressure, which obviously 
is the is a great breeding ground for uh, crime, and uh, that can lead to uh, external threat actors, as we've seen uh, traditionally, or even more so insider threat. If you look back at the 2008 crisis, the surge in the amount of insiders that that surfaced during that time was very, very significant. And the percentage of attacks overall from an insider perspective grew dramatically over that financial crisis. It's no surprise. People had that financial strain. Some of these people, which maybe have kind of been on the fence prior and really haven't taken the dark side, maybe this is the time they do take the dark side. With this COVID period, this becomes all that more challenging because now alongside that financial crisis, we also have the fact that people are all working from home and that in its own right leads to an emotional detachment from the company. And as much as we'll use the Zooms of the world and WebExes of the world and have team building activities virtually, it's not the same thing. And there isn't a happy hour that we all get together and you don't see your peer on a day-to-day basis and so on. And that creates some emotional distance from the company. And if, again, I, I had it in my mind to maybe be an insider and now I'm also less detached and, and less attached to the company, um, that obviously provokes more of that activity. And finally, Tal mentioned earlier, from a privacy standpoint, it's just a lot easier for me to be an insider today because nobody is prying and looking over my shoulder and I get to do whatever I want to do in the um, uh, secure environment I have in my basement as opposed to uh, the cubicle I may, might be sitting in the office. So there's more attackers out there, more opportunities and more attackers. And then finally, how are we doing from a detection standpoint? So with, with all this coming uh, ahead and going to be hitting us, can we detect activity? Can we detect malicious activity and, and wrap our heads around it? And um, I think that the short answer is no, we can't. And one of the main reasons that I'll address here is that over these last few years, we've adopted many AI behavioral analysis anomaly detection type of technologies with the hopes that this is in a, 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 uh, solving all of our problems with the promise of what artificial intelligence can do. I think artificial intelligence provides a lot and will provide a whole lot more even. Um, I think we've woken up from the bubble of Yes, we'll just plug in this really um, intelligent machine that will solve all of my problems. That is not the case and hasn't been the case prior to COVID and has actually been accompanied with many different uh, issues such as false positive rates that are high accompanied with the security staff that just can't handle it. In the COVID period, this, this problem grows uh, extremely significantly. And the reason is that any such system is based, any anomaly detection system is based on the fact that you know what normal looks like, or you have a sort of sense of what normal looks like, and you can baseline that. But we all know there is no normal anymore. And if we think we can have any type of system figure out what a normal looks like today and what the new normal looks like tomorrow, and the new normal looks like the week after, and the new normal looks like the week after, um, that's, that's definitely something that we're setting ourselves up for failure because everything is changing on such a rapid basis. We cannot say this used to be the case and now any, any deviation from that is something that we want to know about. In that regard, you think about employees today, all of a sudden, again, they're working from different locations. By the way, today it's even quite stable. They're all working from home, right? So it, it's changed, but it's a stable change. Tomorrow morning and through this reopening that we're all going through, suddenly they'll, suddenly they'll be coming into the office sometimes and sometimes they'll be at home and sometimes they'll be at their local Starbucks and things will be even more erratic than they are today. Um, you have people that are working different hours and they're sharing responsibilities and time uh, and, and time and schedule with uh, their spouses and maybe they used to do nine to five and now they do nine to 12 and then a long break to be with their kids, and then again, four to nine o'clock at night. And suddenly, if somebody is doing business transactions at midnight, um, yesterday it might have been suspicious, today it might make sense. And when we think about detection based off of a known good, that is a problem, and that is a problem we need to, to address. So I do believe that we have a substantial um, 
a substantial challenge in front of us with, again, more opportunities, more attackers, less means of detection. Uh, we do need to get ahead of this. We, need, we do need to be thoughtful in how we adapt technologies that will actually be able to work in this type of environment, in this type of erratic environment, and technologies that we know we can stand up, roll up, operate very easily given we have so much more on our shoulders and given the fact that we'll need to make changes all of the time for the foreseeable future. So uh, not easy, but uh, I'm hopeful that uh, we can all get there, but we do need to, to be thoughtful about it and, and, and figure out our way to get there. And with that, uh, um, uh, thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to share my uh, kind of notes and passing it back to you, Mario. Great. Thank you so much, Tal and Ofer, for sharing some insights with us. We have a few questions that we'd like to ask you both. For our audience members, please use the chat feature to ask any questions you might have. First, we talk a lot right now about good hygiene, washing hands regularly, wiping things down, etc. What actions can both individual employees and companies take to maintain healthy cyber hygiene, especially when everyone is working remotely? Offer, I could uh, take this one. Um, so, uh, you know, definitely, um, you know, now that everybody might be using their home machines, unmanaged machines to connect uh, to the office, uh, whether it's VPN or VDI, or just using a, a SaaS app, um, you know, from the browser, uh, just to make it very, very practical. Uh, I think um, the least, uh, you know, everybody should do, like the basic hygiene you're talking about, Mariel, um, is to make sure that users have basic security controls in place. Uh, things like asking them, and I'm putting up a written policy that you should be using a, an up-to-date operating system. You know, some of them would not know how to do that, right? But um, many of them will, uh, and you can instruct them in a simple way now with Windows 10 and other operating systems. Uh, turn on Windows updates, turn on full disk encryption, uh, turn on, make sure you have Windows Defender uh, turned on like a basic uh, um, best practice. Make sure you have some password to your machine. Um, you can use Windows low and passwordless login, which is great. Um, make sure you have user access control on so that you're not running as admin all the time. Um, and if you can, containerize your corporate data as it's being accessed on the machine uh, with some kind of local container. Um, and if you have no other option, go with just a written policy to recommend that. Uh, but if you can enforce this with some kind of uh, solution, it could be a mobile device management solution, MDM or something like that, um, Intune or other solutions, uh, that would put you in a better starting place uh, and kind of something that I think everybody should do as a basic. And I'll offer if you have anything to add on that. Uh, yeah, um, one specific thing that, uh, that uh, we're seeing quite a lot worldwide is issues around credential management. Um, this is a known problem for many years, but uh, it, it hasn't got all that much better. Um, so in that regard, I would say we definitely want to invest in figuring out, uh, out from an identity program, how are we managing accessibility? How are we managing, managing our credential rollovers? How are we managing the fact that people are not reusing passwords across a myriad of applications and such? Uh, this tends to be the, the simplest way for attackers to, to get a foothold into the network and, and move around the network. Ariel, awesome. back to you. Yeah. Great. So just to follow up on that question, beyond good cyber hygiene, what are some ways security teams can better control user privileges and credential misuses? That seems really important right now. All right. Offer, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so, so I think some of this is back to the basics. We've seen uh, uh, many cases where when you think about your Active Directory configurations, there are mishaps and things that aren't looked into, which, which open up all kinds of unnecessary holes. Um, a classic example that we see everywhere is the, is a profound number of shadow administrators. And you'll, you may lock down your, uh, domain admins and monitor them and everything and make sure that they're all good and said and maybe you even uh, have a, a PAM program um, that will that will handle privileged accounts 
but if there's dozens of other users that are actually shadow administrators and have the same privileges as those domain admins and you don't know about them, those are exactly the holes that attackers will utilize and, and such. So a lot of it is going back into configurations, auditing and validation that what we intended is actually the practices that we have set up. Um, a lot of it will go through fixing fundamental issues of uh, people storing passwords in all kinds of places. Um, so it's, it's kind of back to the basics in that regard. I think that there's, with not a very substantial amount of effort, uh, and there are different uh, tools and products and means to, to assist you with that, um, I think we can get a very long way. So a small investment can, can fix a lot of our most fundamental problems. And, and if I can add, you know, uh, another piece of advice, uh, you know, things like zero trust and uh, conditional access, uh, for example, with Azure AD, which is very popular uh, these days, kind of making sure that uh, when employees uh, access enterprise web applications, for example, uh, they have uh, kind of a zero trust broker, making sure they're accessing it from a safe device um, and using, you know, if possible, SSO uh, to make It seems we might have just lost audio there for a second, but let me move on and ask the next question that we've got from the audience here. So can you elaborate on specific risks associated with using VPNs? Are there specific things users should be aware of? Oh, Tal, it seems like you might still be having some audio issues there. Oh, Fair, do you want to take this question? Yeah, so Tal and I have been struggling with uh, with a similar thing. Uh, I, I also lost the question, but now I'm back. So uh, could you repeat it? Can you elaborate on specific risks associated with using VPNs? Are there things that users should be aware of? Yeah, sure. Um, well, VPN, uh, I think, uh, first of all, the, the subject of the day is, has been split tunneling, right? Um, should you enable it, should you not enable it, how to enable it, what applications, and so on and so forth. Um, obviously, many of the companies needed to upgrade their infrastructure and uh, allow for broader bandwidth to support what is needed. But in the midst of that, uh, I think a lot of out-of-band things had to be done in order to continue to, to let the, the business keep running. Um, so from uh, that perspective, um, what I think uh, we, we ought to do is just figure out very clearly when anything we do utilize th those out of band means like split tunneling, be very thoughtful in terms of what applications we actually do trust and don't trust and how do we enhance monitoring on, on the endpoints and such themselves to validate that if something has gone wrong, we can detect that. So if we're gonna compensate more on the, on the front end of the security, we, that needs to be balanced. That needs to be balanced now with something in, in terms of anticipating more breaches to be had and a better means to detect that activity. And I see Tal nodding his head, so I think he has audio. <laughs> well, kinda. You, you can probably hear us, but we can't hear you yet. We still can't hear you, Tal. All right, so I'm just going to jump in. Okay, I'll just jump into the next question here um, while Tal figures out this audio issue. Um, isn't the risk minimal for employees if they're using a locked down corporate laptop at home? 
Yeah, for sure. Um, first of all, let's uh, even when we talk about lock, lockdown corporate network, uh, there is no totally locked down, right? There's always there there are always issues and in ways to circumvent certain types of defenses. So is the, is there an issue? Absolutely. Um, is the fact that now they're working from home 24-7 as opposed to maybe doing an hour a day or two hours a day as they did in their previous life, is that an issue that, in, that increases the risk? Absolutely. Because now, obviously, more attackers will have access. There's more opportunity for them to actually uh, circumvent some of those defenses. So, yes, it is an issue. And, yes, we need to get ahead of it in terms of... Uh, and um, again, kind of following on to what I said earlier, how do we detect more because we anticipate more is coming, plus maybe take uh, on some more innovative types of approaches, um, such as what isolate the way I, I find always very interesting, the way that it's kind of split between even if we have a corporate environment, we're still going to be doing things that are outside of the corporate world. How can we carve those out and do them on the side without infecting the actual corporate network? Right. Uh, can you hear me guys again? Last try? Yes, I'm back. So thanks. Thanks for the patience. So uh, definitely, thanks all for it. And I think just to relate back to your split tunneling comment, I think one thing we've heard a lot is that, um, you know, compliance wise, um, split tunneling becomes a big deal now when, you know, you as a customer, you might, you know, you want not to have split tunneling for your own security needs, but what we've heard oftentimes with tech companies and uh, banks and so on, that their customers might require them, no, you will not connect your laptop at the same time to my sensitive info and to my, um, you know, to the internet, right? And now this becomes some kind of a contractual kind of thing, a compliance thing where, uh, you know, customers might be in trouble with their customers through this corona situation uh, and the crisis. They actually opened up split tunneling. Um, that might be what we've heard uh, trouble down the road with their contracts and audits uh, around that, uh, which is a pitfall uh, that ma many are um, handling right now. Just to add on top of that, that previous question, and uh, Mario, you can take it on to the next one. Great. So I have a little bit of a specific question here. Um, so for somebody who is working in an SOC, they're seeing a lot more alerts recently. Some of these are real incidents, but many are false positives. There is no simple answer to make them stop due to the complexities of cybersecurity and working with many different tools, but it has to improve at least somewhat. Can you guys comment on this? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the, the sock of the world or socks of the world uh, have been bombarded by amount of alerts for forever now, right? Um, and we've all been talking about um, uh, the, the deafening amount of alerts on the one side, but also about the skills shortage and the fact that we can't, uh, we can't attract and retain enough talent to actually manage and handle this vast amount of alerts. As I mentioned earlier, especially when you think about uh, more of the anomaly detection systems, many of our customers are reporting that they're getting a 300 to 500% increase in number of false positives due to 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 life being a a, a bag of anomalies today, um, so that is absolutely a critical thing to fix for. And you you know, talking to many CISOs out there, I I tend to hear many times that people are beaten down by this problem and have kind of accepted this as a reality that there are a vast amount of alerts and we can't get to all of these alerts. I myself think that, you know, this is one of those battles we cannot afford to uh, pick our hands up and give up on. Uh, this is a must-win battle. If we are not able to manage what the SOC gets, <clears throat> we have zero chance to succeed against attackers, literally zero. Uh, with all of the noise going, going on, can an attacker blend into that noise and fall below the radar? Absolutely. Um, it, it, it's how many of the breaches that we've seen have later security vendors went back to the company that was breached and said, "Hey, look at you know, look at my system. Three months ago, I alerted you about about it." What they don't say is, "I've also given you another three million alerts." And yes, that one was 
part of it, but how in the world could I ever see it given all of the noise that is accompanied with it? So this signal to noise problem is a critical key component to fix for. And when we think about our talk, I think this is a time that whether we like it or not, we have to go back to the basics. We have to reevaluate how we're thinking about our SOC and, and figure out some of those fundamentals that we're actually able to get through the, the alerts that we're getting. A SOC is not an, it, it should not be looked at as an alert producing machine and the more the merrier. We need to have less and we need to have them of high quality. Great, thank you for answering that question, Ofer. So that's all of the time that we have for today. Thank you to everyone who joined us for today's webinar, and thank you to Tal, Ofer, and Nadav for sharing your insights and expertise. If you have any additional questions or would like to connect directly with us at Hisolate or with anybody at Elusive, you can either reach out directly to me, Marielle Sable at marielle at hisolate.com, or Jason Silverman with Elusive at jsilverman at elusivenetworks.com, and we'll put you in touch with the appropriate person. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful rest of your day. Goodbye.